Hi everyone, I'm Jack, a radiology trainee based in London. Chest x-rays are the commonest imaging exam performed and they're extremely useful in emergency situations. Therefore, interpreting chest x-rays is a key skill for doctors. Today, I'll take you through how to interpret chest x-rays. This video is particularly aimed at late year medical students and doctors in their early years. This video is only for information and does not represent medical advice. This also shouldn't be used for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. So without further ado, let's go. Right, so first we'll talk about how chest x-rays or radiographs are taken. Then I'll talk through a structure for interpreting them and we'll go through a few examples of important findings. In order to take a chest x-ray, x-rays are fired from an x-ray tube towards the object, which in this case is the patient's chest. After that, they then reach the x-ray detector, which is how the image is formed. There are two ways to take chest x-rays. One is the posterior anterior or PA projection and the other is the anterior posterior or AP projection. This is important because it will affect how the images look. For the PA projection, the tube is far behind the patient and the patient is hugging the detector. Because of that distance, by the time the x-rays reach the patient, they're essentially parallel. So structures in the chest are better represented in terms of their size relative to each other. I will mention that although this photo is a stock image, it looks alarmingly like me by pure coincidence. For AP chest radiographs, the x-ray tube is a lot closer to the patient and they're facing it. This is typically used for patients who are more unwell or less mobile. The difference here is because the x-ray tube is closer, the x-ray are more diverging, which means that anything near the front of the chest, such as the heart, will appear larger. So here we can see some of the key differences between PA and AP projections. The main difference being that the heart appears larger on the AP chest radiograph here, and that's important so that you don't mistake the patient for having heart failure. Now let's talk about how to interpret chest radiographs. Essentially there are three colours you'll see on a chest x-ray, and these represent the densities of the materials. So you either have white, which is dense bone or metal, you have black, which is gas and you can see that outside the body and also in the lung fields and lastly you'll have grey which can represent anything in between so things like soft tissue for example. The key thing to understand is that what you're looking at in a chest x-ray is human anatomy that's been projected onto a flat 2D image. So these two large black areas are the lungs because they're full of air. The shape here in the middle is the heart. Up here you can see what's known as the aortic knuckle also above the heart, you have the superior vena cava, which comes up like this. Up here is another gas-filled tubular structure, which corresponds to the trachea. And you'll also remember that lungs have hyla, which is where the vessels and main bronchi enter each of the lungs. We also have bones such as ribs and clavicles projected over all of these structures. And that's important to know because sometimes these will be overlying each other and you can get the appearance of a, a density being there when it may not actually be. Now let's talk through the steps you should take when interpreting every chest radiograph. It's important to have a clear structure for this because a systematic approach is the only reliable way for you not to miss anything. The first thing to assess is the technical quality of the image because this will affect your interpretation. And the acronym that people often use is RIPE, which stands for rotation, inspiration and inclusion, projection and exposure. For rotation, you're looking at whether the patient is rotated. And to assess that, you make sure the spinous processes here of the vertebral column are in between the heads of the clavicles here. This is important because if a patient's rotated, you might think that their mediastinum is deviated when it actually isn't. Next is to look at inspiration and inclusion. So for a chest x-ray, a patient has to have taken a big enough breath in, otherwise it can look like there's pathology in the lungs. To assess this, you want to count at least six anterior ribs. A common question I've had before is how to tell which part of the ribs are anterior and which are posterior. Or well, if you imagine the ribs attached to the vertebral column posteriorly. You can see that these are the posterior ribs and if you follow them around, they become the anterior ribs. The anterior ribs seem to disappear in the middle of nowhere and that's because they join to the costal cartilages. Cartilage is less dense than bone, so they don't show up as well. So you just count uh, at least six of these anterior ribs. Inclusion means making sure that the lung apices and the costophrenic angles are included. Otherwise you could miss a small pleural effusion or a small apical lesion. Next is projection, which is what we've mentioned uh, as PA or AP. This to me looks like a PA radiograph. And that's because of the size of the heart uh, and also the shoulder blades are pulled outwards. Lastly, you look at exposure, which is ensuring that the x-rays have essentially penetrated through. And for that, you can assess it by making sure that you can see the vertebral body through the mediastinum. This is possibly less relevant now that we have digital radiography and you can sort of window the image. Now let's look at the actual search pattern. Most people will use an ABCD structure. So airway, breathing, cardiomediastinum, diaphragm, 
and everything else. So for airway, I start by looking at the trachea and making sure it's fairly midline, which it is in this case. For breathing, I compare the lung field side by side and look at the upper zone on one side and compare it with the other side and then go through different zones. Don't forget here to look at the pleura as well. So make sure you look at the costophrenic angles in case there's a small effusion. Uh, follow the edge of the pleura and look for a pneumothorax uh, right into the apices there. Do that on both sides. For the cardiometastinum, I like to follow the right side down like this, making sure the heart border on the right is crisp and making sure that this area, the right paratracheal stripe, is pencil thin. I then do the same on the left, so following the aortic knuckle, left atrium and left ventricle. Also remembering with the cardiometastinum to look behind uh, because sometimes you'll get extra structures or lines. Next D is for diaphragm. For this you look at both the hemidiaphragms, the right should be above the left. Underneath the left you'll often get the gastric bubble. But also don't forget that there could be things in the abdomen that you end up catching. So sometimes you will get a, a gallstone or a kidney stone that's visible. Next you look at everything else, uh, which is essentially the bones. So that's checking the scapulae, the clavicles, all of the ribs and the vertebral column as well, because you might see a fracture. But also don't forget to look at the soft tissues because you may see things like subcutaneous emphysema, uh, but also in female patients uh, in the breast shadows, rarely you might see a, um, a cancer there. Finally, and importantly, uh, is to check what we call the review areas. These are areas where pathology is commonly missed and therefore you should really make an effort to check them. So look at the apices. This is quite a busy area with lots of structures overlying. Next, look at the lung hyla. Now the right hilum should never be above the level of the left. And here you can also look for uh, things like bulky lymph nodes. Also remember to check behind the heart because there is a lot of lung still there that's being obscured by it. And also remember to check behind the diaphragm. Again, because the lungs pass below the dome of the diaphragm. Okay, now let's go through some example cases. Firstly, we have a 25 year old male with chest pain. So I want you to pause the video and get some practice using the search pattern that I've explained and try and work out what the diagnosis is. This is essentially a normal chest x-ray. I know it's kind of mean for me to put this in, but it's really important to get familiar with looking at what normal is before you start looking at pathology. The other important thing to mention is that chest x-rays are often requested for chest pain. So it's really important to keep a broad differential diagnosis of all the various causes of chest pain that there are. And a few of them are up on the screen now. On to the next case. Pause the video now and have a look and see what you think. So this is an example of a right-sided tension pneumothorax. That's because you've lost the lung markings in the entire right hemithorax. And what would make it a tension pneumothorax is that the mediastinum is deviated away from the affected side. When you're seeing this as a doctor, of course, you have to think about the next step because tension pneumothorax is a medical emergency and you need to think about urgent treatment. Um, so that's your AT assessments and your uh, needle thracocentesis, but that's a bit beyond my area. Next, have a look at this case. So pause the video. This is a case of right middle lobe consolidation. When you look at the image, you can see there's a pacification around the right mid and lower zone. Consolidation is essentially where the alveoli get filled with uh, either pus or fluid or other material. And because the bronchi still have air in them, they then show up as what are called air bronchograms. Another feature of consolidation is something known as the silhouette sign. And the theory behind that is that if a lung lobe develops consolidation or another pathology, whatever it's lying next to will become obscured. So in this case, the middle lobe is against the right heart border. And because of the consolidation, you can't really see that crisp, clean edge that we saw before. Again, think of the next steps. So things like antimicrobial therapy. Now pause the video and have a look at this one. So this chest radiograph demonstrates many of the features of cardiac failure. Firstly, you have cardiomegaly or large heart. On a PA projection, the width of the heart should be less than half of the width of the thorax. So in this case, you can see it's more. Other features include upper lobe venous diversion. This is sometimes called the stag's antler sign, uh, where you can see the upper lobe pulmonary veins uh, distended, like stag's antlers. Other features include alveolar edema, uh, which is a fluffy kind of perihylar edema. You can also look for septal curly B lines. Um, I think there is one here in the right costophrenic angle. Uh, this essentially is interstitial edema. And again, you think about the next step. So things like uh, diuretics or doing other tests like BNP. Uh, again, beyond my area. Now have a look at this one. Well done if you've seen that this is a right pneumothorax. 
An important principle in radiology is uh, not to stop when you find something, and um, that's something known as the satisfaction of search. When you see the pneumothorax, you have to think, what else could there be? So the eagle-eyed of you may have seen that there is a small right pleural effusion, which you can tell from this fluid level and blunting of the costophrenic angle. Uh, if you look on the other side, for example, you can see it's a nice sharp point. The other area to make sure you look at is bones, because rib fractures can cause pneumothoraces. Uh, in this case, you can see um, eighth and ninth rib fractures. Um, and for those, as you're following them along, you can see that the cortex of the bone is not in continuity. Also, if you correlate it with the clinical history, they've probably fallen off the ladder, broken some ribs, and those are caused a pneumohemothorax. Now have a look at this one. So this is a large left-sided pleural effusion. You have a pacification of the left mid and lower zones, through which you can't really see any lung markings. It's important with pleural effusions that the x-rays done with the patient sat up. That means the fluid falls down with gravity and is easier to appreciate. The other feature of an effusion is that the added fluid will push the mediastinum away from it, as you can see here with the trachea and the heart being pushed to the right. Again, think about the next steps, such as what are the causes and what diagnostic tests you might do, such as a pleural aspirate. Now try this one for size. It's a bit of a busy image. So this is an example of right to lower lobe Collapse. When a lung lobe collapses, it will tend to fall in a certain way. If you think about it, the other lung lobes will expand to fill the space. So in this case, the right to lower lobe gets pushed down against the right hemidiaphragm. So what you will typically see is a triangular shaped opacity uh, with its tip or apex at the hilum. You may also see other associated features like volume loss. Uh, so for example, the mediastinum here is a bit deviated to the right. Remember this image as a classic example of a right lower lobe collapse. The other really important thing with every radiograph is to look for lines and tubes. This is a bit beyond the scope of this talk, but this patient does have a tracheostomy. They also seem to have a pick line and a left-sided chest drain and a nasogastric tube. Next case, pause the video for this one. So this is a classic example of right upper lobe collapse. Again, you have a triangular shaped opacity with the apex pointing towards the hilum. The right upper lobe, when it collapses, tends to go upwards like this. Next case, pause the video. So this is middle lobe collapse. It's quite a tricky one to spot, um, but again, you have got this uh, almost triangular opacity. Because the middle lobe is adjacent to the right heart border, as we saw with the consolidation case, it will obscure that right heart border, so it's not as crisp as on the other side. Now pause the video for this one. This is an example of left upper lobe collapse. Uh, this is a particularly hard one to spot because essentially the entire left hemithorax is a bit more opacified than the right. Essentially, when the left upper lobe collapses, it collapses against the anterior chest wall. And when you take an X-ray, it essentially gives you this generalized shadowing, um, which is known as the veil sign. Now pause the video for this one. So this is an example of left lower lobe collapse. Again, you have a triangular opacity here behind the heart and the apex points towards the hilum. This is known as a double heart border or sail sign. The other feature you would get is the uh, left hemidiaphragm is typically obscured because the left lower lobe is adjacent to it. Now have a look at this one. So this is quite a tough one because you have widespread opacification of the right hemithorax. Your initial thoughts might be that this could either be a very large effusion or a very large collapse. The way to tell is to look at the associated features. In this case, the mediastinum is very severely pulled towards the site uh, of the abnormality, and that's consistent with volume loss, which would be a sign of collapse. So this is right to lung collapse rather than a large right to pleural effusion. Try this one. So this is a case where you need to make sure you look at the airway. If you remember the normal chest x-ray, the trachea is usually fairly midline, but in this case you can see it's deviated to the right, and you could even argue it's slightly compressed. That's why it's important when you're looking at a breathless patient to consider all of the differentials. In this case, it's compression of the trachea from a thyroid goiter. Now try this one on for size. So here in the left apical region, you can see there is a, an ill-defined mass-like opacity. That combined with a history that's consistent with the Horner syndrome, you think about something like a Pankow's tumour or a lung tumour uh, in the apex. These things are really easily missed um, because there are so many structures in the lung apex, which is why you should deliberately look there. The other tip is to compare it to the other side um, and you can clearly see that it's more opacified. Now try this one. <laughs> 
Again, the other review area is to look behind the heart because the lung does go behind the heart and you can see an ill-defined mass-like opacity. These are places where it's really easy to miss a lung tumour. So if you spot one, you're potentially saving this patient's life. Uh, well done to the eagle-eyed view that spotted there. It's probably a, a small right to pleural effusion as well. Now try this one. This is another review area. Uh, essentially, if you compare side to side, you can see the left lung hilum uh, is much bulkier. And this is around a region uh, known as the aorta pulmonary window. And this is very close to the path of uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve which innervates the muscles of the larynx. Um, so invasion of that nerve can give you hoarseness. When you see bulky hyla, you think about things such as uh, TB, lymphoma, sarcoidosis if it's bilateral, um, but this could also be a lung tumor. Now try this one. Again, another really important review area uh, to check is below the diaphragm. Uh, under the right hemidiaphragm, you can see a rim of air, and that's consistent with a pneumoperitoneum. In this patient, you'd be really worried about um, some kind of bowel perforation. So the take home messages here are to always have a structured approach. Don't stop when you find something, keep looking for the other associated findings and always, always check your review areas. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments, like and subscribe for more and I'll see you next time.